First of all, I want to thank all of you who are attending our um, journey to Antarctica. Um, I'm very excited about this because this is definitely a destination that is on my bucket list. And um, I want to introduce our guest speaker today. His name is Rory Martin. He's the Deputy Director of Expedition Operations for Seaborne, and he's going to tell you a little bit about himself and take us on this wonderful journey to Antarctica. So you can go ahead and take it away, Rory. Great. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to everyone. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Rory Martin, and I'm Deputy Director of Expedition Operations for Seaborne um, Cruise Lines. And I'll get into a little bit more about my background and, and who I am, but I want to kind of first go into what we're going to talk about today. Um, this slide here kind of shows you the outline of the conversation. Um, if at any time someone has a question, uh, please go ahead and, and type that in, get in contact with, with Kim and Lisa, and uh, they're more than happy to interrupt me, and, and I'm happy to engage people as, as the conversation continues. So we're gonna start by talking about the what, the why, and the who of expedition travel. Quickly give you a breakdown of Seaborne's evolution into expedition. Uh, introduce you to, it, to the new expedition ships class that we're uh, gonna be bringing on line in 2021 and 2022, and how that's gonna make a difference in expedition. Uh, I'll quickly showcase some of the public space and the premium suites of these ships that are currently being built, and then share again some of the destinations that we'll go, uh, be visiting. Um, when I talk about the Meet the Seaborne Venture on, on that section three, um, I'm also gonna introduce you at that point to Antarctica and showcase some of the incredible experiences that you'll have down there. So let's go ahead and begin then and talk about the what, why, and who of expedition travel. Um, expedition travel in itself has, is kind of a tough word. I think when people hear the word expedition, they think of hardcore, roughing it, that you need to be fit, you need to be outdoorsy. Um, and it's not that at all. Expedition travel is, is basically a, just a, a a new way of looking at something, a new way of traveling. And not that it's new at all, but it's, a, it's an aspect of exploring and learning and being adventurous. Um, expedition travel is somewhat of a learn-based experience where you're going to these remote and, and far off destinations and experiencing them through the eyes of an expedition team that's made up of numerous different professions and disciplines scientists and academics and just pure expedition operations. But you'll have this opportunity when you do these expeditions to see through their eyes, see through the eyes of an ornithologist, a geologist, a historian, a marine biologist, um, a botanist. Um, so you have this tremendous tool chest of expertise on board that as you take these expeditions, you take these journey experiences and travel experiences that you're able to learn multiple facets of what you're seeing and doing. Um, it's truly, truly addictive. And, and that goes into the why of the expedition. Um, expedition really enlivens your senses. Um, for those that have been on an African safari or back country, um, or have actually been to the polar regions or anywhere that mother nature is in control, you know that when you're out there, all your senses are alive. You see better, you smell better, you taste better. For those that have gone on an African safari, when you spent all day out in the bush and you come back and you have that dinner, um, it's the best food you've ever had. When you're sitting by the campfire and you're having that cup of coffee out in the back country, it's the best coffee you've had. Expedition travel and the experience itself just invigorates you. It, drives your curiosity, it drives your energy. It, um, it's like no other, and it's a, it, it is a truly addictive type of experience. You are environments that you're able to see and things that you'd normally see like on Blue Planet or BBC specials or documentaries. You're interacting with this incredible platform of Mother Earth of experiences that you'd only dream of and that always have been on people's bucket lists. Um, like for example, this photo of Easter Island, 
uh, with the horses running by the, the beautiful heads. You look at that, but you never realize, for example, that you're missing the whole body. This is kind of like an iceberg out in, in, in Antarctica or the Arctic, where you're only seeing 10% on the surface. And you start learning about the 90% beneath. And that's what expedition travel is. It's really building the depth of your experience and the destinations that you're visiting. You know, this polar bear was taken uh, up in Svalbard in, in the Arctic. You know, you come across these phenomenal experiences. This right here is a uh, fish larvae, a flying fish, probably around an inch in, uh, in length. Um, the larvae of flying fish, for example, uh, they give birth and they, they hatch and they blend themselves in with, with debris and seaweed on the surface of the water. And this, I was scuba diving in the South Pacific and I'm in the water looking up at the flying fish larvae. And again, this is only around an inch in diameter. And uh, so you have the sky, you have the clouds, you have the sun, but it's experiences like that that make this a tremendous travel adventure. So this goes into the who of the expedition travel. Um, again, starting off with what I was saying about expedition travel, Expedition travel is for everyone. Um, every demographic, every age group, every fitness level. Um, there's no age that is not fascinated by exploring the, 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 the nature of this world. Going out and learning about what, what fish you're seeing, what the life cycle of a krill is, um, what humpbacks do um, in the breeding cycle and, and what they're doing down in Antarctica. Uh, to the petrels and to the king penguins and all the other breeds of uh, species of penguins. The who of expedition traveler is really anyone who immediately experiences it, they're captured. So going back to my introduction, um, my background is in business, but I grew up overseas uh, for the majority of my life. My father was a U.S. diplomat and I was born in Colombia and grew up in Colombia, Paraguay, Brazil, Pakistan, Iceland, Botswana. And that was all by the age of 16. Um, to me, the world is my home. And there is no corner that I have not seen as of yet. And uh, it's a place that I constantly want to re-see. I'm addicted to travel. Um, my background in business, I um, was in technology. But throughout that whole time, I traveled extensively and started getting into a lot of expedition travel. A lot of it initially was land-based and the idea of going on a cruise ship was far from my, my, my preference. But I realized in order to get to remote areas, to get over, able to get to Antarctica and able to get to areas in the South Pacific or in the Arctic and so on, I had to start going on ships. And at first I never really knew what expedition travel was on, in regards to the cruise line. Um, at that time, uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, they were actually small research vessels, uh, Russian rust, rusted ships that went to these far areas. The groups were really small. Um, so you're going off in these things, you're playing top dollar, um, but you're also roughing it. You're in bunk beds with seat belts, you know, attached to it because the ships aren't really designed for, for rough waters and so on. But anyway, I got addicted to it. And when Silver Seas, for example, started their Prince Albert at that time, back in 2008, um, I went on it. And soon after that, I basically did every itinerary that the Silver Explorer had. Um, I started doing other programs with other expedition companies um, and just was completely addicted because I couldn't get enough. I, the learning aspect of expedition travel, um, this aspect, for example, People have Antarctica as their bucket list that you want to go there one time. And I'll tell you this, that it is, it should be on everyone's bucket list, but it is not a one-stop shop. For those that go to Antarctica, you want to continue going back. And that's what expedition travel does to you. And it's not just Antarctica. It's most of these destinations. You go once and then you want to start seeing it in different times of the year, or you know that no matter how often you go, you're never going to have the same experience because you're going to come across these incredible moments, whether it's a polar bear, um, whether it's a humpback bubble feeding, uh, whether it's penguins and, and laying of chicks. Um, 
there is no trip that is identical to another trip and it captures you. So through that, I became friends with a lot of the people in the expedition team. Uh, my demographics, you know, I'm quite young in regards to at those, that time when um, the people that would join those trips. And so I naturally kind of fell with the expedition team. Plus I was an avid learner. I was the first one up, last one asleep, first one on the Zodiacs, last one back on. Um, and so slowly and surely when Robin West, who's currently the vice president of Seaborn, uh, started with Seaborn back in 2013, uh, when the Seaborn quest started in Antarctica, he asked me to be part of his team to, to uh, go down to Antarctica. He knew I drove boats, he knew I'd been to Antarctica numerous times. Um, and so I joined his team and would help out over the years. And fast forward to, 20, um, to last year, 2018, when Seaborn announced um, the introduction of, or the int introducing their new expedition ship that was gonna be built in 2021 and the second one in 2022, uh, both he and Rick Meadows asked if I was willing to move to Seattle and oversee the expedition side on the corporate side, on the business side of, of Seaborn. And so I agreed and moved here to Seattle last year and have been uh, helping with the design and operation of Seaborn's expedition product. So as I mentioned, uh, Seaborn Expedition started in 2011 when we introduced, when we thought about bringing Seaborn Quest down to Antarctica. 2013 was what our, our voyage down to Antarctica, which we've gone now every year since. Um, with a team of 18 expedition team members. In 2015, with the success of the program and the huge interest that uh, our guests had on expedition, we inter introduced Ventures by Seaborn, which is a program that we offered on the rest of the fleet, which is an optional program that is offered of kayaking, of Zodiac trips, of hiking and so on. And then in 2018, we introduced the, uh, the announcement of, of the two expedition purpose-built ships. So I'm just going to now quickly introduce Seaborn Venture. So this is the rendering of the current ship that is uh, being built. Um, the keel will be laid out actually beginning of next month. The ship will be completed and we will set sail June of 2021 with its sister ship uh, in 2022. So Unlike the rest of Seaborn ships, here's another photo of it, it shows you the back deck. What makes this ship special is for one, we only, the ship has 132 suites, all oceanfront, all with verandas, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, so that's 132 cabins for a total of 264 passengers. Um, the rest of our fleet, as you know, the, the, the Quest and the Odyssey, uh, carries 450 and the Encore and Ovation um, carry 600 passengers. So this ship is quite intimate, but it's the same as the rest of the fleet in regards to the services, the luxury aspect, um, and the amenities. Um, so as I was talking about earlier, the expedition differences. So the ship that we're building has a what we call a PC6 ice strength and hull. PC6 stands for Polar Class 6. And what that means is that this ship's hull is designed to go through first year ice uh, that can be three to four feet in, in depth, in thickness. Um, we're gonna have advanced maneuverability with Ozopod propulsion systems, with um, three bow thrusters, with uh, dynamic positioning through, net, through um, uh, the bridge technology. Uh, we're going to have a, a team of 26 expedition members on board that are covering a variety of different disciplines. As I mentioned earlier, ornithology, geology, history, marine uh, uh, biology, and onwards. It's, it's, we're going to have a tremendous breadth, as we currently do with the rest of the fleet. Um, on the Seaborne Venture, um, on the main fleets with the, the sea, Ventures by Seaborne program, we have teams from anywhere from six to 14 team members that cover Northern Europe, Alaska, the Amazon, and of course the expedition component 
on the quest with a team of 18. Um, the ship has, again, 132 suites. Uh, we're going to have 24 Zodiacs. We're also going to include mountain bikes, scuba diving, snorkeling. Um, in addition to that, we'll have the optional aspects of kayaking. And what makes this really special, too, is we're going to have two submarines on each of these ships. And I'll get into that in a moment. But uh, two submarines to now take our expedition exploration uh, beneath the water. And for those that are familiar with the oceans, oceans represent 71% of our Earth. And only maybe 87% remain undiscovered. So for example, Mars and Venus are much more detailed in, in understanding the landscape than our underwater world. Uh, we're also going to have an open bridge policy, meaning that guests can go up to the bridge and, and with the expedition team, be first, first in line there of watching how we navigate through ice, uh, going through scenic areas, and really engage with how the, the, the captain and, and the officers navigate the ship and operate the ship in these amazing places and waters. As with the rest of the fleet, we also have all the same standards that we have throughout the uh, seaboard on the luxury side. Um, I'm not going to go into these because I want to kind of really go into some more aspects of the destinations that we want to visit. But these are all staples of Seaboard's luxury services. So now going into the submarine. So this is the submarine. It is six passenger, one pilot. Those seats rotate in different directions. The pilot's in the middle. And it's a complete sexy machine. It's going to have the capability of going down to 1,000 feet. Uh, it has an endurance level of uh, or ratio of nine, 18 hours underwater. Um, we're going to have them on side bay doors, as you can see here. Uh, the Zodiacs will all be on the top of the ship, but this side bay door is, is going to be um, where we'll keep the subs. Right in the center of the ship, we'll have a, an access door that will take people off the ship onto Zodiacs. And then I'm going to now play a video for you of the submarine. And I'll kind of talk a little bit. It, there's no music on it, so no need to turn your volume up. So again, here's a rendering of the Seaborne Venture. This is the submarine. So these submarines are being built in the Netherlands. We're going to have two on each ship. So as we explore these waters, we're basically going to drop these into any place uh, where we're going through. Here's a, a kind of a 360 of, of the acrylic uh, balls. What's really interesting about these acrylic uh, bubbles is that once you're submerged, once you're in the water, it's almost impossible to tell where the acrylic ends and when the water begins. And so imagine when you're underwater, you're feeling like you're actually in the water. I mean, obviously you're in the water with the submarine, but you feel like you're just breathing it all in. Everywhere you look is uh, uninterrupted view of, of your surroundings. So those are the two submarines that we're going to have on board. And let's see if we can power through. And so now we'll talk about where we're going. So this is a, a map of our first year itinerary. Um, you can go online to seaborn.com and, and pull this map up as well. And if you can see my map, actually, let's see if I can get a laser pointer going here. All right. So here's my laser pointer. I hope everyone can see that. So we're going to start off in, in Europe, in Lisbon, and we're going to get up to um, England, France, head up into uh, Scandinavia, Norway, and we're going to head up here to Langerbin, uh, which is uh, the capital of Svalbard. This is the far north Arctic. We're going to head down, hit uh, Greenland, go around Iceland, come back up, uh, Baffin Bay, east west coast of Greenland, up to Baffin Bay. Up in this area, you'll see the narwhals. You'll see in both these areas over here, narwhals, uh, belugas. You'll see walruses. Polar bears will be all in this area, along with uh, the Canadian Arctic. We'll head back down, uh, go through the Caribbean, cut across the Panama Canal, go down the west coast of South America. And then we're going to spend a lot of time down in Antarctica. 
And what's great about the Antarctica voyage is we'll have numerous different voyages in lengths from 11 days up to 20 days. And those different days depend on whether we just go back and forth from Ushuaia to the peninsula, you know, spending six, seven days in the, in the peninsula here. Longer voyages, we'll try to go deeper down into the peninsula, down into the Ross, into the uh, uh, Arctic Circle, uh, Antarctica Circle. We'll also spend some time in South Georgia and the Falkland Islands. So after our Antarctica season, we'll head back up Buenos Aires, go up through the coast of, of South America, and then we're gonna go do the Amazon. Now, a lot of ships currently go to Manaus, which is right in the dead center of the Amazon. With this new ship, we're gonna take it actually all the way to Iquitos. Now imagine this, that as the crow flies from the delta of the Amazon all the way to Iquitos, would be the same distance as if you took a ship as the crow flies direct from Washington, D.C. to Denver. I'll let that sink in for a moment. The Amazon's amazing, amazing place, and the size of it is unreal. And we'll come back out, we'll cut across the Atlantic, uh, go towards Africa, and then when we hit back to Europe, that's when we're going to introduce the second ship, um, which hasn't been named yet. So here's the kind of an area that we're going to be exploring down in the Antarctic. The peninsula, the Falklands, South Georgia, uh, Ushuaia is on the very tip of, of South America. And so here's one of the typical um, voyages, but this one's actually 21 days, and this is going to be the Christmas voyage. Um, Christmas, we always try to hit South Georgia Island. For anyone in the expedition industry, if you want to ask them where their favorite destination is, South Georgia to all of us is our Mecca. That is our heaven. And I'll explain to that in a moment. But Antarctica in itself is a place unlike anywhere else. Aside from how remote it is, it is breathtaking. So like this picture was a, a photo I took of a humpback um, down in the Lemaire ch uh, Channel down in Antarctica. The light down in Antarctica is phenomenal. Um, the plethora of animals, the biodiversity, the penguins, the birds, the seals, the whales, it's unreal. So here are some king penguins. This is South Georgia Island um, in South Georgia. Um, so South Georgia is a special place for, for all of us is because of the landscape, of the ecosystem, of the history, um, but one of the things that's one of the most memorable parts of, of, of South Georgia is when you make a landing at, South, at Andrews or um, Salisbury Plain and you hit this beach that's just littered with fur, ping, fur seals, elephant seals, and king penguins. And you're just amazed at this, the volume of animals in front of you on this beachhead. And we always tell people as they get off the Zodiac, ignore what you're seeing right now and head up to this, the top of the beachfront and that's what you're here for. And people kind of disregard what you're saying. They start taking pictures and you kind of encourage them. No, you really, really need to keep moving. And we take people to the top and all of a sudden they see this. 250,000 pair of king penguins. The sight literally brings some people to tears. They hit the top of that and they have tears running down their eyes. The emotional impact is unreal. It is, your senses to begin with are firing, but it's just everywhere you look as far as you can see are thousands and thousands and ten thousands of these penguins that are just absolutely majestic. The brown ones are, are the little ones. So then you get into the elephant seals. This is an elephant seal pump. Um, all these animals just completely capture you. And then when you're sitting there and you're talking to our ornithologists or marine biologists, and they're talking to you about the life cycle of penguins. So this is a gentoo and it's chick. Um, right here in the top, you see just a little white knob on top of that chick. And basically that they use that to crack the eggs as they enter into this world. Um, so this is a gentoo just looking down at its chick. Um, obviously the chick's waiting to be fed. This is an Adelie penguin, kind of like the Charlie Chaplin of Antarctica, a spectacular penguin with a lot of attitude, funny as can be. Each of these penguins, for those that have ever seen um, that Walt Disney movie, Happy Feet, 
before you go to Antarctica, watch that movie. And then when you come back from Antarctica, watch it again. And you'll see how brilliant Walt Disney did depicting some of the personalities. But the personalities are extremely strong, like the chin strap. Chin strap is another small of the penguin species that is tough as nails, but it's like a Jack Russell. He thinks he's so much bigger than he really is. You could spend hours just watching penguins. Their hardiness, their strength, um, they're certainly not the smartest of animals, but they are absolutely filled with personality and filled with a lot of oomph. So here's an incredible iceberg. You'll see some penguins in there just kind of give you a sense of scale. And now that I've mentioned that this is, these are penguins on this, this iceberg here, you're only seeing 10% of it. 90% of this iceberg is beneath the water line. So one of the things that always, as you're going through on the ship or on a zodiac, you know, you'll start talking about this glaze, this iceberg, and you can start learning about the different characteristics of it. So this iceberg, for example, this used to be the water line. So you can see that it's shifted somewhat. Um, it, most likely a piece in the bottom is broken up. It's ri risen a little bit. This right here is called a foot. But all these icebergs can show, show you a story of, of what it's like and what it is. Um, here's a view of Antarctica uh, down on the mountain range. I, I sometimes describe Antarctica as a place that it would be like flooding the Alps and taking a ship and just cruising along its peaks because you're surrounded by these five, 7,000 foot peaks coming right off the waterline, surrounded by glaciers that are 400 feet um, you know, tall and just right here where you see my, uh, my cursor. Um, scale is something that looks a mile away is five miles away. There is no sense of scale down in Antarctica. Everything is grand, everything is pristine, everything is absolutely amazing. You don't wanna sleep because you're afraid of what you're gonna miss. This is probably at one o'clock in the morning. Um, again, these mountain ranges that have tremendous character and, and depth to it. I mean, look at the glaciers and the ice just sitting on top of this peak, um, the depth of this ice field here. It's all spectacular. So I'm gonna now go into the public spaces of the ship. And one of the great things about the differences of, of expedition travel with Seaborne is, you know, in the, in the past we would, you would go on, as I mentioned, research vessels and such. And Seaborne has now introduced this, this level of luxury travel to these destinations, not taking away the expedition experience, but enhancing the side of it from where you're seeing it from. So you're going to these very unfamiliar places, but you're going in a place that's very familiar and comfortable. Um, so let's go into these public spaces. So the expedition lounge is what we call the heart of the expedition ship. This is a gathering spot that's central to everything, the main dining room, um, to, the, to what we call the discovery center, which is the, a room that we're gonna have as a lecture hall, as an area for briefing and debriefing. Uh, this is a place where we are gonna gather people to then go into the mud rooms, which we call the landing zones, to get onto Zodiacs and back from the Zod uh, Zodiacs back onto the ship. Um, so we wanted kind of an area that was warm and comfortable. This is Discovery Center. Um, this is where we'll have briefings to bring all the guests together and talk about where we're going that day and what to expect. And then after a day of expedition, gather everyone back and talk about what we saw and what we experienced. And then talk again about what we're gonna to see tomorrow. Uh, the screen that you see on the right is 33 feet long, eight feet wide, and is LED lighting. Uh, so it's high definition. Um, you'll other notice we designed it so there's no obstructions throughout the whole room with pillars. And the room can seat everyone. The dining room, again, comfortable, cozy, intimate. Expedition travel is unlike other type of travel in which everyone is bonded together with the experience. Um, you're on this cruise, everyone's sharing the same experience and it is phenomenal because it changes the, the environment of the ship. Everyone is there for the same purpose. It doesn't matter whether you're a, 
a club member or have been 500 days on Seabourn or this is your first voyage, on expedition ships, everyone is as special as everyone else. Everyone's going through the same experience. Everyone's engaged with each other. Everyone's sharing photos of what they saw. Everyone's jumping off the ships together on Zodiacs, making landings together. So it really builds the spirit and combines that spirit of expedition. Because on expeditions, everyone's on it together. Everyone's relying on everyone. So this is the back deck off the colonnade. Um, as you can see, we're, although these are depicting winter scenes, um, we're also gonna spend a lot of time in the tropics, uh, from the South Pacific to the Caribbean. Um, once the two ships are together, you can think of all the other expedition ships and itineraries cover the globe. Um, so we, we, we will migrate with the seasons between the North and the South polar regions, and then going through the different oceans as we go from migrating from North to South. One thing special about this ship too is the amount of deck space we have. We always encourage people to be outside and on the deck. And so we built this ship with a lot, a lot of viewing space on the back outside decks. And with a team of 26 team members, we'll have these uh, specialists throughout the ships to help narrate what we're seeing and what we're doing. From spotting animals to narrating the geology of the, the uh, landscape we're crossing, uh, to even talking about the history of explorers going through these waters. Um, quick thing about the suites. Um, this suite right here is called the Grand Winter Garden. It's actually a double deck suite, a two level suite. This is the bottom level. This right here that you see is this top level. So the bedroom's on top and there's floor to ceiling windows that are two stories in, in, in height. Tremendous amenities on board. Uh, in, the, in these suites. This gives you a view of the living room at uh, the top. This TV rolls down into the uh, cabinet here to give an unobstructed view of the water and of the scenic view uh, that you have out your window. The panoramic view, you have a tremendous uh, open space of, of glass. Uh, what you don't see is the bathroom just to the left. And that has a bathtub that actually has a, a window view that again, continues this openness of connecting you while you're on the ship to the outside. Um, with the premium suites, as we do with all, all uh, the rest of our fleets, we have all these incredible amenities. Um, with the expedition ships, we have a partnership with Swarovski binoculars. So each ship will also have a, a premium set of binoculars on, in their suites to use while they're uh, on board with us. So then to kind of recap on the destinations that we're going to, um, as I mentioned, we're pretty much going to hit the, the globe. Um, and we're going to be doing it uh, basically like a dance with the other ship going from north to south. We'll hit the Arctic, the Antarctica, the Amazon, the Caribbean. Um, in the seasons to come, we'll do the, uh, the South Pacific. Um, again, this shows you the, the overall view of, of 2021's itinerary. And so now I want to kind of show you where in the map for example, where Svalbard is. So in the Arctic, I showed you the map earlier of, of Antarctic. So when we hit the, Ar the Arctic, you can see how far north we're gonna be. From the top of Svalbard, which is on the very top of the circle here, the Arctic, uh, the North Pole is basically around probably seven to 800 miles away. So it's that close. Um, you can see when we go to the Baffin Bay, how far north of the, of the Canadian um, Arctic we go to. And then as we move forward, here's a typical example of flights down in, uh, flights up in, in the Arctic. And if I can just go back towards the Antarctic, as you can see the, on this one voyage, it's a 15-day voyage, also to Reykjavik, there are charter flights available. And the same with the Ar with Antarctic. Um, we all, on many of those voyages, we will have chartered flights included in the fare that take you from Buenos Aires to Ushuaia to join the ship. So in this case here in the Arctic, we have flights that go from Oslo to Langerbin, where we'll spend some time in Svalbard. And here we'll go down to Jan Bayan Island, which is this remote island of Norway that there's a, uh, it's a volcanic island that has a small weather, military weather station that Norway has, make landings on there, um, and then continue on to this area of Greenland that is absolutely spectacular with its icebergs, its glaciers, 
Um, and, you know, again, we're looking for polar bears. Polar bears up here, polar bears down here. The set of islands on the far right, those are Franz Josef Land, which is the Russian uh, Arctic. So as I was mentioning earlier about the Quitos. So you can see right now, Manaus is in the center of the Amazon. The idea is to take the ship from Manaus to Quitos. And as I mentioned earlier, that's the distance of, of Washington, D.C. To, to Denver, Colorado. So here gives you the kind of a breakdown of, of the river system through there. And interestingly enough, as we go to the upper Amazon, this is where our strength and haul actually plays to our advantage because uh, other hauls aren't capable of going up the river because there's so much debris of, of logs and such. And so with this strength and haul, we're, allowed, we're able to go all the way up into Iquitos. So some really exciting stuff ahead of us. Um, so again, one of my, my favorite quotes, uh, it's from a Persian poet and, uh, and a traveler. And his quote goes, traveling, it leaves you speechless, then turns you into a storyteller. And I think it's true for a lot of our travels, you know, whether you're on an African safari or an expedition in Antarctica, you know, at first you go back and it's hard to, to share what the experience was to people until you start developing and digesting what you experience. And that experience then turns to that story and it's endless. And one thing about expedition travel is it doesn't only capture you away from home, but it actually captures you while you're at home. Um, you'll come back from expeditions and you'll start being curious about the birds in your yard. You start getting curious about the, the botany, the trees in your neighborhood. Um, you actually get a little sympathetic for the squirrels that are stealing your bird feed. And you start wanting to learn more about their behavior and their breeding cycle um, and how long they live and how they eat. Um, so again, expedition travel opens you. It enlivens all your senses and makes you wanting more every time. And one thing about it is, as I'm a testimonial to it, once someone experiences expedition travel, that's the way they want to travel from that point forward. Once you get onto a Zodiac and you see how easy and capable it is, um, you don't want to stop. And that goes back to that aspect of the demographics, um, the age of, of people experiencing an expedition. You know, there is no age limit. I've had 90 year old um, individuals come on Zodiacs with me. Um, at first, they may be timid of how to get on a perfectly beautiful luxury ship out onto a small rubber Zodiac in the middle of cold waters of Antarctica. And once they see how easy it is, and once they see how we, we take them on board, and they get situated and we take them on a Zodiac tour and then make a landing and they get out of the Zodiac and they set foot on the seventh continent and they walk a little bit ways and they go to a, the rookery of, of chin straps. From that day forward, they're a lot of times the first ones up to go out and be first in line because they can't get enough of it. Um, so again, it's of all capability of, of ability, of age. Um, you know, I did a lot of, of, of work even during the times when I was doing personal expedition bringing my laptop and just hooking up to Wi-Fi or cell phones, depending on, on where I was, and managing, doing a lot of things at the same time. So even for the baby boomers or, or that are still working or the techies, the millennials, you know, anyone and everyone is your clientele for this. Anyone is there to experience this. And, uh, that's kind of my story, and I, I hope uh, I explained everything well enough, and I'll definitely open it up for, for questions right now, and uh, happy to go back to any of the slides you wish to, to review, and again, I just thank you for the opportunity of, of talking about uh, expedition to begin with, uh, but also sharing what uh, Seaborn is doing in the expedition arena and introducing to uh, uh, Seaborn Adventure and then our second ship soon to be and all the luxury comforts that uh, we're going to be offering. So again, thank you very much. Uh, Rory, 
Yes, ma'am. I was wondering if you could uh, give a little more detail about getting on and off the zodiacs, how that works exactly. Absolutely. No, so you covered it a little bit. Absolutely. So a zodiac is a inflatable boat. Uh, zodiac used to be a French company, uh, used to actually make uh, blimps. Uh, Jacques Cousseau got uh, them famous through his explorations of, of waters using zodiacs to explore marine life throughout the world. Uh, the military uses zodiacs uh, quite often uh, in operations. Um, but zodiacs are extremely sturdy, hardy, inflatable boats that the expedition industry exclusively uses. And what we do is we bring them alongside the ship and tie them up. And there's a bay door just on the side of the ship, right where my cursor is. And from there, we just actually have you step from the ship onto the Zodiac. Uh, we have uh, team members there to, to have you uh, secured to step onto the Zodiac. You walk onto the Zodiac and then you sit onto the tubes. And from the tubes, um, we board people. Then from there, we, we untie and we go off on either on scenic tours or make landings in remote areas and get people off. And uh, so Zodiacs are just this extremely sturdy platform that we use to explore the lands and, and the places that we go to. Um, the submarines, uh, we'll be taking Zodiacs out to, to get you onto the submarines. On the kayaks also will load you onto Zodiacs and take you out uh, to load onto the kayaks. Um, so up on the very top, we'll have 24 Zodiacs uh, stored up there for our use. So it's just a very easy, simple a step of just stepping from the ship onto the pontoon and then onto the floor of the Zodiac and then taking a seat on the pontoon. Perfect. And then uh, another question is, can you tell us a little bit about the weather and, and when you're going to be traveling to Antarctica? Well, the season occurs in the wintertime. So we actually, um, the season has begun right now down in Antarctica. And uh, talking with friends that are there right now and such, uh, they're having a lot of blue, blue, beautiful, calm days. You know, we're going down to Antarctica during this, their summertime. Temperature usually is in the low 30s. Um, but, you know, it also can go up to the 50s and 60s. Uh, there was a record of 68 degrees in the peninsula three years ago. Um, you know, you're dressed for the weather. I, never, I always say that there's never bad weather, it's bad gear. Um, but the great <laughs> thing is you're, you're able to be out in the weather for as long as you want or as little as you want. So if you get cold, step back in, grab a hot chocolate, put a shot of Jameson in it, walk around. <laughs> Go back to your suite, go up to the spa where the sauna has a, a window that looks outside into the, in, into the areas that we're sailing to. Um, on the very top decks, we'll have heated benches. You know, it's the weather, people always worry about how cold it is, but it actually is not. Um, you know, you're dressed appropriately. And again, if you get cold, you step inside. But Again, it's, it's, it varies, but again, when the weather does change, it, it changes quickly and drastically. And so it, the weather can get bad and, and, and uh, cold, um, but again, you're on a ship that's quite capable and uh, you have the proper gear. So on these polar regions, you will be getting a, a complimentary polar jacket, um, you know, that you'll complement that with your own base layers and waterproof pants and, and boots and such will be provided for you uh, on the ship. Um, it, same thing with the Arctic. Uh, the season starts there summertime in the Northern Hemisphere and same type of uh, weather conditions. So I hope that answers your question on that. Yes, yes, very much so. So I, I know I'm excited watching this and, and you've done a fabulous job creating a wonderful picture of, of what it's like to visit Antarctica. Uh, and I was telling Kim as you were talking, I think maybe I should put a group together to go um, for 2021. So hopefully we'll get maybe some people that can join us on this because I think this looks fabulous. You know, it's again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, everyone wants to hit their, their seven continents and do their uh, country counting if, if, if if that's what you wish. And, and there are people that just go down there just for that. But 
most people, when they go to Antarctica, they are jonesing to go back again. Um, even since 2013, we have a, a really, I mean, Seaborn to begin with has a really high repeat clientele. I mean, people that go on Seaborn tend to, to return over and over again. The percentage of people going back to Antarctica on Seaborn is much higher than even just the, the normal thing. I'll go down every year now and, and I come across people that I've seen for the last three years. And they're now on their fifth voyage in Antarctica on, on Seaborn. And so that's what happens with this type of experience because you're just, you're always learning, you're always seeing something different and you just feel alive. You, you feel younger. And that goes back to this other topic of the demographics. For those that are on, on the older side of, of the spectrum, you know, once you get onto a Zodiac, once you make a landing and you see how capable you are, it actually makes you feel younger. It makes you feel, you know what? I can actually do all this stuff. And so the idea of expedition travel then becomes a norm for them because they know now that they're not old for this. They're very capable of, of experiencing everything that we're doing. And not just that, but doing it on the comfort of an ultra luxury ship. Wonderful. Well, Roy, thank you. I don't see any other questions in the um, question and answer box. But if you happen to think of questions that you didn't ask, ask tonight, you can email me at the office, Lisa Torgerson. It's Lisa T at travelxinternational.com. And I'll be happy to, if I don't know the answer, to get in touch with Rory and get the questions answered for you. So, Rory, thank you so much for um, sharing your time with us. We really appreciate it. And, and hopefully we will um, be in touch with you and, and taking your group to Antarctica. Great. Well, hopefully I'll see you on board. But if not, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. It was wonderful. <laughs>